Thank you very much. Good evening and welcome. My name is Ken McIntosh. I'm the presiding officer uh, here at the Scottish Parliament. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to Holyrood and to this evening's grand final of the Donald Dewar debating tournament. And I want to start by paying a particular uh, warm welcome to our four winning finalists. We have Balfron High School over here. We have Bearsden Academy. We have St. Andrew's Academy. And we have St. Margaret's School for Girls. So welcome and well done all four of you already. Uh, and I also want to welcome all your friends and family and your teachers in the gallery. Uh, I know that you've come a long way uh, to show your support uh, some distance. The Donald Dewar Debating Tournament is an annual event run by the Law Society of Scotland. And I'd like to welcome the representatives from the Society this evening and their partner organisations, Hodger Gibson Publishers, the Glasgow Bar Association and TC Young, who have helped make this event possible. The competition is, in fact, the biggest, biggest uh, schools debating tournament in Scotland. This year, I believe that there were 128 teams from 94 schools the length and breadth of the country. There have been more than 30 first round heats, 16 second round heats and four semi-finals. And now you, the four winning teams, have made it to the grand final. So congratulations to all of you. And I look forward to listening to your speeches shortly. And this is a, a particularly special year uh, for the Scottish Parliament and for the Donald Dewar Memorial Debating Competition as we're both celebrating our 20th anniversary year. And it's also a particularly significant year for the Law Society who are celebrating uh, their 70th year. So congratulations on your milestone. And I hope you continue to uh, deliver the great work and the commitment to Scottish law that you have shown over the last 70 years. Now, thinking back to the opening of the Scottish Parliament in 1999, Donald Dewar, who was Scotland's first First Minister, said, the past is part of us, but today there is a new voice in the land, the voice of a democratic parliament, a voice to shape Scotland, a voice for the future. And your voice, the voice of Scotland's young people, is vitally important to us in shaping that future. And we take every opportunity to engage with you and hopefully to listen to what you have to say. And in that same speech in 1999, Donald Dewar said, I look forward to the days ahead when this chamber will sound with debate, argument and passion, when men and women from all over Scotland will meet to work together for a future built from the first principles of social justice. And I'm certain that if Donald had been looking down in this parliament building here today in the heart of Scotland, he would be particularly delighted by this evening's proceedings. Young people from schools across Scotland, possibly some future politicians amongst you, presenting your arguments with passion. So once again, a very warm welcome to all of you. And can I take this opportunity to wish you the very best of luck this evening. Thank you. Now, oh yes, move this out of the way. Thanks, Douglas. Now, before we start, I'm going to outline uh, the format of the debate this evening, which I think actually for the young people you'll be very familiar with, but for everyone else who's not. Uh, I'm going to call on the first proposition speaker to speak. They will have six minutes. I will then call on the first opposition speaker to speak, and they will also have six minutes. This is repeated for the second proposition speaker and the second opposition speakers before we open the debate to the floor. During these four speeches, I will announce when your first minute is up, and this will indicate that interventions are now permitted. I will also let you know when you have entered your last minute, and at this point, no interventions will be taken. When your six minutes are up, I will ask you to wind up, and if you continue further, I will ask you again to wind up after 30 seconds. Now, please be aware that there are clocks um, all around the chamber, and I would ask our debaters to observe those time limits. The debate will also open up to the floor, for a further 15 minutes, and I would encourage, in fact, I don't, sh I don't think I've properly welcomed all the other schools that are here this evening as well. Can I just do that now? I think we've got eight other schools here from Scotland, um, and uh, I'd like to thank you for taking part and for coming along this evening. And in fact, if you contribute at this stage in the open floor debate, 
Uh, I've been told that uh, judges will award a £50 book voucher to the two best floor contributions. So I hope that will encourage you. I don't think you need any encouragement to raise your hand and make a contribution from the floor. We'll then hear reply speeches from the opposition and proposition. Uh, and those will last no more than three minutes and there will be no interventions. And again, I will let you know when you've entered your last minute. So I'd like to remind the teams that it is your choice whether or not to respond to any of the points raised in the floor debate uh, and your performance will not be judged on the floor debate. The motion for debate this evening is this House believes that the Scottish Parliament should have an appointed second chamber. So a very topical one for me and my colleagues. I know Ash Denham, one of my MSP colleagues, is here as well, so we'll be taking particular interest in the arguments you put. Our judges this evening include Ash, who's a, a, a minister within the Scottish Government, a Minister for Community Safety, Victoria Lane, Senior Solicitor at Brodie's, Andrew McPake, debate coach at Craigmount High School and a three-time winner uh, of this very tournament, uh, our presiding judge, Sarah McQuirter, uh, a Senior Associate at uh, Slater & Gordon, Jim Bold, solicitor at TC Young and also member of the executive committee of the Glasgow Bar Association, and Jennifer Gallagher, partner at Lindsay's. So thank you all, our judges, for agreeing to give up your time this evening and taking part. So I would now like to ask Balfron High School and St Andrews Academy to leave the debating chamber through the doors, well, that door at the back, actually, and we will commence the first debate. So thank you. Can I just say, by the way, you are incredibly well behaved. The chamber is never as quiet as this, ever. So, yes, Ash, take a note on this, I know. Thank you very much. So if we're ready to start, uh, I'm going to call on Sarah Mackay to open the debate as the first proposition speaker. And Sarah, you have six minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, presiding officer, it has been nearly 20 years since the opening of the Scottish Parliament. Nearly 20 years since MSPs pledged allegiance to the people of Scotland nearly 20 years since the very namesake of this competition became First Minister. This signified a change not just for Scottish politics, but for Scotland itself. Tonight, we are debating a possible next step for Scotland, a next step that will make Scotland even stronger than it is now. Tonight, I will be opening the debate and the case for side proposition by defining the motion and introducing the points of what a second chamber would do and why we need one, and how an appointed second chamber would be more beneficial than an elected one. My partner, Ms. McClure, will go on to show you how a second chamber could be more cost effective than the opposition may lead you to believe, and how a second chamber would produce higher quality legislation. We define the Scottish Parliament as the lawmaking body in Scotland for devolved matters, and the body which currently scrutinises the work of the Scottish Government. Our definition for a second chamber would be in line with the views that former First Minister Jack McConnell expressed in the press a few weeks ago. A second chamber would take the form of a consultative assembly. It would not have a legislative function, but instead provide more accountability and give councils a larger say. We define appointment, appointed as not an old school style network, but instead we wish to appoint those representative of today's Scotland, with leaders in the business and voluntary sector as well as representatives from each local authority. We feel it is more than adequate for the Assembly to sit part-time, meetings consisting of um, discussions on big issues, such as Scottish budget and key legislation. And this, ladies and gentlemen, brings us on to my first point. Why we, and I mean everyone in this room, need a second chamber in the Scottish Parliament. We all hear every day in the news the many headlines about the current state of modern politics. Just this week in The Guardian, ministers have been accused of shocking complacency. We have the chance to make a change by creating the second chamber. And if we don't, we will be joining those ministers in shocking complacency. 
A second chamber can provide an additional check on MSPs. The extra level of scrutiny can deal with what Lord McConnell put as a gap in the terms of accountability and engagement 20 years on from the creation of Scottish Parliament. I would now like to delve deeper into who would be members of this second chamber by moving on to my second point. As I'm sure most of you have noticed, tonight's motion specifies that a second chamber would be appointed rather than elected, just like the House of Lords south of the border. However, ladies and gentlemen, the appointment of Scotland's second chamber could not be more different to that of the House of Lords, filled with the elite of society. Instead, we wish for a second chamber filled with today's Scotland, a place where local authorities can be empowered without the superiority which plagues the House of Lords. Lord McConnell emphasised that councils have been disempowered for over 20 years and that there is a need to revitalise and re-energise their voice. An appointed second chamber will allow this and in turn creating a stronger, more united Scotland. Yes, please. Sorry, would uh, Matthew Burton? My, my oh, <laughs> uh, Presiding officer, whilst they make a suggestion as to uh, be representative of today's Scotland, you take no account into bias, so they will have political leanings, political allegiances. How can you ensure that we won't have bias in our second chamber from today's Scotland? Same guy. Presiding officer, we see the speaker's point and we are committed to ensuring that there is no bias in the second chamber. We wish that everyone is represented in the second chamber. If this formula is followed, there would be no need for an election to decide members. While elections confer clear political legitimacy, they also give campaign advantages to party participants and may entail party control of the resulting chamber instead. Of course, low voter turnout may also be an issue. Point of information from Matthew Burton. Uh, yes, please. If this uh, second chamber is to represent councils which are elected and will follow uh, what the people have elected, how can it be truly appointed and independent? Sir Mackay. Uh, presiding officer, um, what we see is that by representing um, people from the local authorities, we are ensuring that this, this chamber would be representative. As said by former Labour Minister Janet Anderson, an appointed house could well end up more representative of the electorate than an elected one. Ladies and gentlemen, presiding officer, the namesake of this competition, Donald Dewar, once said, there shall be a Scottish Parliament. One minute to go. Through long years, those words were first a hope, then a belief, then a promise. Now they are a reality. Tonight's debate shows a potential future for Scottish Parliament, a future that represents a Parliament more just, democratic and fair. The political landscape in 2019 is one much different than in 1999 when the Scottish Parliament first opened, and we cannot allow a second chamber, something that has the potential to improve our political system, not be created just because the current system has worked in the past. Change requires a leap into the unknown, but without change, we would never have had progression. Without change, we would never have had devolution. And without change, we would never have had the Scottish Parliament. So, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to take that leap and embrace change. I beg you to propose this motion. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, now, before I call, I just apologies to Michael Dunn. I've only got a few duties, and one is to get all, everybody's names right. I've fallen down my first duty. But can I now call on Matthew Burton to respond as the first opposition speaker? And Matthew, you also have six minutes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Matthew Burton, and I'm proud to be opening case this evening for side opposition. First of all, I'd like to say we would accept side proposition's definition of the motion. Tonight, I'll be discussing why a Scottish Parliament why a second chamber has no purpose in the Scottish Parliament and is really simply just added bureaucracy, whilst my partner Michael will be discussing the danger to democracy posed by an appointed second chamber. First, however, I'd like to begin with some rebuttal. So the proposition suggested that this appointed second chamber would be representative of councils. However, as I raised in my POI, councils themselves are elected. So if it's representative of elected representatives, surely it's really just indirectly elected rather than appointed at all. Uh, so I, I feel they've strayed away from the motion a bit on that uh, account. They also mentioned that this second chamber would be more democratic. However, 
If we are not electing it, how can it possibly be more democratic? Surely an appointed democratic chamber by hampering the will of the people um, who elect the democratically elected One chamber minute. is less democratic. Uh, yes, please. Senator McKay. Uh, presiding officer, um, does the speaker not agree that we could have public nominations to who would be appointed in this chamber and therefore the public would have a say? Matthew Burton. Well, the, the proposition never actually raised that uh, in, their, um, in their speech. And just because you have public nominate doesn't mean the public get the final say on who is in the chamber. And so it still fails to be truly democratic. Um, they also fail to go into detail on how we would make this truly representative. While we have a mix of professions, races, uh, religions, political allegiances, that's incredibly difficult to achieve, especially when people's political views change month by month in opinion polls. How can we really make this second chamber truly representative? And now I would like to move on to my substantive case. So I'd like to base my speech on going through every possible reason we could think of for having a Scottish Parliament, every possible function it could fulfil, and explain one by one how the Scottish Parliament already fulfils those functions, and so how a second chamber is unnecessary. So the four possible functions we came up with are to prevent the tyranny of a majority government, to keep a government within its legislative competence, to allow in-depth scrutiny of legislation, and to provide an expert opinion on issues. First of all, they need to prevent a major majority government falling into tyranny. In a functioning democracy, we need a system to prevent a government implementing extreme policy without building a consensus behind it. In Scotland, the system we have to achieve that is the additional member system for electing members of the Scottish Parliament. AMS essentially means it's very hard for a party to form a majority in government. Yes, please. Jessica McClure. Um, presiding officer, does the speaker not realise that in 2011, um, SNP gained public majority? I'm fully aware Matthew that Burton. the SNP formed the majority, and I will deal with that in literally about 30 seconds. So, it's very hard to form a majority, and when there's no majority, parties need to cooperate and form consensus, and that essentially acts as a break on any one party implementing extreme policy without first building consensus. <coughs> as the proposition highlighted, it has happened before that the SNP has achieved a majority, However, to do that, the SNP needed something like 45% of the public vote. They already had to build a consensus behind their policies before they got into majority government. So we still force parties to build a consensus around their policies before they are able to implement them. So AMS prevents a government implementing extremist policy without the consent of the people. It prevents a tyranny of the majority. And so we do not see this as a role for a second chamber in the Scottish Parliament. The second chamber, the second issue I'd like, to, the second possible role of a second chamber that I would like to discuss is keeping a, a government within its legislative competence. So what do I mean by that? Legislative competence is the areas a government can legislate over without overreaching and inappropriately legislating over human rights or the constitution, for example. This is commonly performed by second chambers such as the German Bundesrat or the French Senate. But in Scotland, we have a system where the appropriate minister, the presiding officer, the Attorney General, Lord Advocate and Advocate General all have to declare a bill to be within legislative competence before it can pass into law. And any uh, concerns they have about the legislative competence can be referred to the UK Supreme Court. So with the strength of these checks around legislative competence already in place, we don't see it necessary to have a second chamber to fulfil this role. Yes. Chair McKay. Uh, officer, does the Speaker not agree that with a lack of time and resources, sometimes legislation cannot be fully checked? Well, oh, sorry. Uh, well, actually, um, within the, the statutes that the Scottish Parliament follow, there is a set time that uh, all those officers of the law are al allowed to have to review the legislation. It's four weeks, uh, which does provide them with ample time to review it and check there's no legislative overreach, essentially. One the third minute. potential area that um, a second chamber could fulfil is additional scrutiny on government. And this was one that was mentioned by the proposition. So this is the primary function of the House of Lords where they have committees that can look into legislation in depth. But in Scotland, we have very strong committees in our elected chamber, and so there's no need for a second chamber to fill that role. Our committees are stronger because MSPs are selected for committees on the basis of experience. Committees are provided more information, more time, and a more prominent role to increase their influence on the process of legislation passing through Parliament. And that negates the need for a second chamber to provide added scrutiny. Finally, a second chamber can provide expert opinion. However, no reasonably sized uh, second chamber could provide enough 
expert opinion to cover the breadth and depth of academic fields which are becoming increasingly specialised. And so we don't think a second chamber would be able to fulfil this role. Ladies and gentlemen, I've outlined why the Scottish Parliament up, already has the nece necessary mechanism to keep government in check and is frankly pointless. We're throwing away vast amounts of money for nothing in return. And I don't think we need any expert opinion to see that that's a motion we must regret. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. I now invite Jessica McClure, the second proposition speaker, to give us her views. Jessica, you have six minutes. Donald Dewar once said when speaking about the Scottish Parliament, this is a moment anchored in our history. Let there be another moment as we introduce a second chamber. Presiding officer, ladies and gentlemen, I beg you to propose the motion that the Scottish Parliament should have an appointed second chamber. My partner, Ms Mackay, has previously discussed the points of how a second chamber would allow for a more democratic parliament and the issue of appointed versus elected. I will be going on to discuss how in the long run it will be more cost effective and how it would improve the quality of legislation. Before I continue, however, I would like to engage in some rebuttal. Mr Burton basically suggested that we already have a high enough level of scrutiny, scrutiny, scrutiny for, towards legislation. However, it was found by the Westminster Foundation for Parliament um, that the Scottish One Parliament minute. find it hard to prioritise which legis le legislations warrant post-legislative scrutiny as due to lack of time and resources. Mr Burton also talked about how bureaucracy and how it pr presents tyranny in majority. However, as I've already highlighted, there has already been a majority in Parliament in 2011. Point of information so from why Matthew aren't Parson? we changing? No, thank you. Just On to my first point of how in the long run it will work out as more cost effective. By having a second chamber, we won't be putting in that much more money than we already are. But what we are getting out of it will be so much better and therefore more cost effective. As side propos proposition, I would like to reiterate the point raised by my partner, Ms. Mackay, that it would increase democracy and we need this. We pose the question whether a stronger, better, more united Scotland is worth the extra money. Yes, yes, it is. A second chamber will be more beneficial in the long run, regardless of money. However, the cost may not be as high as side opposition may originally think. We have already discussed the difference between appointed and elected. And since the process is appointed rather than elected, there will be no need to spend additional money on elections. The Scottish budget um, for, towards elections was 0 0.2 million pounds just last year and we feel that this is already high enough and therefore by having appointed um, officials instead of elected ones we won't be wasting any more money yes please Matthew Burton we may save compared to having additional elected officials but we're arguing we don't need any second chamber in the first place um, we strongly do not agree with that, presiding officer. We strongly do not agree with that comment, as I will later on discuss of how um, we need a second chamber to improve the quality of our legislation. People have to use this legislation in real life, and therefore we feel it's of the utmost importance. No, thank you. The second chamber theoretically wouldn't even you wouldn't even need a whole new committee room, as they have this impressive chamber right here they could use. What we are here emphasising to you on side proposition is that we're not creating a House of Lords full of prestige and hierarchy and that comes with a hefty price tag. Instead, we are asking for a body of people independent of political party who represent each one of us, the people of Scotland. The introduction of a second chamber wouldn't carry the burden of lots of zeros, so why aren't we already making the change? My second point is how we will improve the quality of legislation. This time would allow for reflection of legislation. This time will allow for discussion and this time will allow for the quality to be improved. 
The main concern side opposition will have is that the reviewing of legislation will take time, and this will mean that bills may be passed slower. Ladies and gentlemen, this isn't just some school rule, no nail polish allowed. These laws have actual big real life consequences, such as fines or even prison sentences. If we want a stronger Scotland, then we must allow these bills to be properly reviewed and revised. Yes, please. Matthew Burton. We've already outlined on side opposition how we already provide an incredible level of scrutiny on our legislation. The pro opposition's case for us requiring more scrutiny is based off a report which they have, frankly, misunderstood. post legislative scrutiny is the reform of laws which are already passed, not laws as they pass through the Scottish Parliament. Jessica McLuhan, you have one minute. Presiding officer, we feel that this would just act as an even bigger check. As Lord McConnell, our former First Minister, said, it would act as an official check on the work of Holyrood, and we need this. To conclude, we can make Parliament better by becoming a bicameral system. As my partner, Ms Mackay, mentioned, um, in introducing a second chamber will increase democracy. And she also mentioned how an appointed um, officials in a second chamber is much better than that of elected. I have also highlighted the points that by having a second chamber in the long run will be more cost effective because in the end we'll get better, more improved legislation, therefore making our government better. Presiding Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, we have a second chance to make improvements, so give us a second, a second chamber. I beg you to propose the motion. Thank you very much, Jessica McClure. And I now call on Michael Dunn, second opposition speaker, to speak. And you have six minutes, Michael. Thank you, presiding officer. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd just like to start by saying what a pleasure it is to be speaking to you today in the debating chamber of the Scottish Parliament, um, the only necessary chamber in Scottish politics. <laughs> so you've just heard my partner explain to you why a second chamber of the Scottish Parliament is just it's not necessary. It doesn't serve a true purpose. Now, I'll continue on our case by explaining why an appointed second chamber would not only be unnecessary, but it would, in fact, be undemocratic, which is opposing the view that proposition would like you to believe. But first of all, however, I would like to engage in some much-needed rebuttal. So, just to clear something up here, say proposition have mentioned that um, we already had a majority in the Scottish Parliament. We had one in 2011. But they're overlooking the point that we're trying to make. The point is that for a... Uh, government to get an overall majority in the Scottish Parliament. It's incredibly difficult to do so. We, you, the SNP needed 45.7% of the vote. They needed to unite the public in order to get that majority. So they needed that overwhelming support just to get into that majority position. It's not to do with the fact that you can't get one. It's just that it's very difficult to do so. And then we heard side proposition. They mentioned so uh, many times about how it's going to be more cost effective and that it's not going to cost more money. The building we're in is 400 million pounds. It costs 400 million pounds of taxpayers' money, 414 to be precise, of taxpayers' money to start up the Scottish uh, Parliament. And then they said that we don't need elections, so that's where the money's going to be saved. And then they even actually went on to provide a place of meeting for this second chamber. And they said that it was going to meet right here. We've already got one perfectly good chamber. But let me ask you this. This chamber sits full time. This chamber is going to be sitting here for a predominant length of time. And then they started saying that they're going to have plenty more time to scrutinize this. But if they can't sit here where they're meant to meet because the priority chamber is sitting here, how do they have that time to then carry on scrutinizing if they can't sit where they're meant to be meeting? So it's obviously going to cost us a huge amount of money to get them a suitable meeting place. Yes, okay. Sir Mackay. We can have our chamber sit part time, and that is only to discuss big issues. Michael Dunn. You see, that's the very point that you're trying to make. So you're trying, you're trying to say that if they sit part time, they're still going to have plenty of time. So if they sit part time, are these people that are then appointed from places of business and uh, the public sector and areas like that, are they just expected to leave their job part time to come and get unpaid work here in a chamber? No, thank you. In a chamber that meets part-time to only discuss the important things. Who decides what the important things is? Is that up to the second chamber? They've not explained anything in detail. So on to my substantive case, that the very nature of an appointed chamber is dangerous to our democracy. So in the UK Parliament, 
Prime Ministers are able to manipulate the scrutiny in the decision-making process by politically stacking a chamber. Now, they've suggested that it would come from areas of the public and it would be suggested by the public. But if it's only recommendations, who has this final say? Surely it would be the government that has the final say. They can handpick specific individuals, like-minded political views to their own, to stack the chamber so that when bills arrive for scrutiny, they aren't properly scrutinised. No, thank you. So, examples could be seen in Prime Minister May when she was trying to put through her withdrawal deal. She said that she would appoint as many Tory ministers as necessary to the House of Lords in order for it to pass unobstructed. Jacob Rees-Mogg actually even claimed, why don't we throw in 200 just so that it doesn't pass with any uh, form of problems at all? Yes, okay. Jessica McClure. Presiding officer, does the speaker not realise um, the House of Lords has, um, pass, has actually had 2,000 720, no, 2,270 changes to bills, and this is why we need a second chamber. Michael Dunn. We understand the point you're trying to make, but as my partner outlined, we have committee stages, we have advocate generals, we have scrutiny in place that isn't in place down there. They have the House of Lords as their main form of scrutiny for the government. We have alternative methods that are working perfectly well. It's a process not dissimilar to the presidential appointments of Supreme Court judges in the USA. They create this kind of carefully selected, like-minded, specific individual that's the perfect fit for them. There's nothing stopping a government from appointing suggested individuals that have SNP support. They have this support that is going to allow their bills to pass unobstructed. Another flaw in the committee system is that too often it's used as this form of reward or this personal loyalty or service. It's similar to the last one. It's to do with cronyism really down south. It's support for your friends or individuals that are being inducted into a second chamber for their good service to themselves perfectly or to a political party and not to the country as a nation. So just last month we had Lord Brookman, he actually it was claimed just shy of £50,000 in expenses but he never made any contribution. How can we ensure that if they're sitting part time, they're coming in here, they're doing the specific work that we need, the propositions motion just doesn't address this, it doesn't address that the people are obligated to arrive here in the chamber. One minute. Cost aside though ladies and gentlemen, we've spoke a lot about it. Do the proposition genuinely think that those who designed the parliament simply forgot to add in a second chamber, that it just slipped their mind one day when they were planning out how to make this? Well, if that's the case, ladies and gentlemen, I hate to say it, but you're sitting in a 400 million pound mistake. And um, the parliament was purposely designed not to be bicameral. We're not just here by mistake. And as my partner Matthews outlined, the success of the Scottish committee systems, the success of the scrutiny we have in place is an alternative to a second chamber. This isn't here to be done as well as we have the motions in place. We're in a parliament of compromise, of collaboration, a chambers in, in chambers and in committees. It's designed to give us the best possible outcome for our nation. So in conclusion, my partner Matthew has explained why the role is already fully fulfilled and it's not necessary. And as I said in my own speech, the chamber only adds bureaucracy. It only adds expense to our decision-making process. Any move away from democracy must be avoided at all costs. And it's for that reason that we stand here, ladies and gentlemen, to oppose the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, and thank you to all the speakers. Uh, and thank you for taking interventions. Again, my colleagues and I can learn uh, from your example. Uh, I'm now going to open the debate to the floor, and the floor debate will last 15 minutes. Uh, so if you wish to speak in this debate, just raise your hand, uh, and then if I select you, if you could uh, stand up, tell the chamber uh, your name and which school you're from uh, before you raise your point. And, uh, but please try and make your contributions relatively short. Uh, the teams can then choose to respond to the point or not as they so wish. Uh, it will not be part of the judging system on your final mark. And before we just start that off, um, I was using the moment to look around the chamber and I've spotted a few of my colleagues in the chamber here. I can see uh, George Adam at the back here, Tom Mason here and Liam Kerr up in the gallery. I know that uh, Liam Kerr's daughter's school is St Andrews, I believe. So, oh, St Margaret's. Well, don't let that, judges, don't let that influence you, though. That's... Uh, so, I'm now going to open this to the floor. So, just raise your hands if you wish to make a contribution on the motion that this, this parliament should have a second chamber. There we are, yes. If you want to stand up and tell us who you are and what school you're from. I'm Madeleine Rayburg and I'm from People's High School. So, this is for the proposition. Based upon today's financial climate, I question the validity and logic behind spending an unnecessary amount of money on a second chamber when you have aforementioned that the other already works. 
when we could be spending the money in a wiser, more useful way. By taking money for a second frivolous chamber, one takes away the finance for other more pressing matters. Thank you very much. I should also declare an interest, that's people's high schools, my mother's high school, so I've just <laughs> got a few favourites here as well. Any other points from the floor? Thank you, yes. If you, if you stand up, hopefully the, the light will come on in your microphone. There we are. Tell us who you are and where you're from. Barry Kinahan, People's High School, with a proposition. Uh, the first proposition mentioned during their speech, we are committed to an unbiased chamber, and it was reiterated several times during the second proposition speech. Now, I'd like to ask who we is. I find this viewpoint incredibly naive. I, I for one, believe that many of the MSPs who sit in this chamber would prefer someone who would pass their legislation without question. Thank you. Oh yes, I'd like to respond. Jessica McClure. Um, we're not saying that um, they would have the powers to pass legislation. We would give them, we're not um, having a second House of Lords, but instead proposing literally just to review legislation, just to make sure that they're of the highest quality. So yeah. Thank you, Jessica. Yes, hang on there. No, no, sorry, the young man then I'll come oh, to you. Sorry. Sorry, yes. I know I'm not pointing very well here. Thank you. My name is Harry Mackle. I'm from St. Andrews and Bride, and my question is also for the proposition. So I was, so this hypothetical second chamber in which people uh, from local authorities are appointed, who would be appointing uh, these members of the second chamber? Would it be an independent government body or, um, Whatever. Katie Muir, St Andrews Academy. Um, how will the second chamber be held accountable if they don't have to answer to the electorate? Good points, all of them for the proposition here. Nobody, nobody putting anything to the opposition. Yes, then. Alexandra Crichton, uh, I'm representing People's High School. Uh, this is also for the proposition. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you said where the money came from and how are you so sure that the taxes will not be raised just to pay for this second chamber, chamber that you would wish to put in? Thank you. Money always comes up in this parliament a lot. Yes. Uh, I'm Harrison Carroll from St Andrews and St Bride's High School. This is a question for the opposition. Uh, what necessarily is wrong with having the second chamber not be representative of the will of the people? We have an elected house for that. Surely this second chamber's role as scrutinising would be much better served by having them be picked as experts of industry rather than of, say, the tyranny of the majority. They would just pick famous people as opposed to the people who are most qualified for the position. Thank you very much. Some good points coming up from the floor here. Yes, Michael, do you want to respond to that point? Yep. Uh, could I, Michael Dunn. Uh, just for clarification, were you suggesting that we would be picking famous people as opposed to industry experts or the other way around, just before I reply? Uh, no, I was just implying the idea that it doesn't necessarily have to be up to the people. The people aren't always necessarily the best choice for the thing. Surely it would be someone that understands the industry best that would be the best choice. Well... For one, I, I do agree that kind of industry experts are important. Um, so committees currently can call industry experts as and when required in, in order to bring in that kind of expertise. Uh, a committee of this size really to fill it with in, experts from industry from all walks of life. You're talking a huge size of committee. Um, and really with regards to the point of how there'd be kind of expertise in that uh, allows for a bit more kind of scrutiny on the government. Well, you are correct. The point we raised in one of the POIs was about bias and that anyone that has the interest in politics will have political leanings one way or the other. So it depends on how these expertise are pointed into and who allows them in uh, would be kind of facing on the bias side of things. Thank you very much, Michael. Any other comments from the floor here? Yes. I'm Rory Clark I'm from People's High School. This is for the proposition. I would like to ask, where is the evidence to suggest the urgency of a second chamber? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, there. Uh, this is for the opposition. Uh, now, you say that politicians are appointed... Could you give your name in your oh, school sorry. first? Sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, Benjamin Gardner of Balfron High School. 
And now this is for the opposition. Uh, you say politicians are appointed on a basis of experience to committees. Uh, but who's to say that politicians have the minimum experience required? Uh, yes. Uh, so politicians oh, are appointed to committees by the Parliamentary Bureau which has the presiding officer and a selection of MSPs from different parties, and they assess what MSPs should join which committees based on what they know about that MP's previous experience in the area of that committee. Thank you, Matthew. So these are good points that have been raised from the floor here. Who else would like to contribute? I'll take the younger young lady here and then the gentleman behind you. Yeah. Um, I am Hallie Murray from P and I'm representing Peebles High School. This is for the proposition. Where will you find independent and willing residents of Scotland to help achieve the completion of the second chamber? Thank you. Thank you. And the young man just behind, yes. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Fraser Gemmell from Peebles High School and this is for the opposition. Um, you said how the Scottish Parliament was not made with a second chamber, but uh, do you not agree that back in those days, um, the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish people did not think it would be, the Scottish Parliament would not be such a big part of our lives as it is today? Yes, Michael, Michael Dunn to respond. Um, I actually do think that in 1999, I think it was when the Parliament first opened, uh, I think the people fully expected it for the devolved powers to become quite a substantial part of our lives. Um, and because of that, I would say that they created a parliament that's a little more modern than the 300 year old one that we have down in Westminster. We have Scottish Parliament TV. It allows you to witness what goes on in committee rooms in the uh, chambers so that you can scrutinize it yourself by watching it from even just the comfort of your own home. Very good. Yes, you there. Uh, Callum Leeson from Inverkeel, and so this is for the opposition. So the opposition argue that committees can scrutinise the work of the Scottish Government. However, in 2014, uh, on the Public Audit Committee, the SNP effectively stopped any criticisms to the, the police merger final report. So effectively, they're not checking or scrutinising the work of the Scottish Government. Thank you very much. Any other points from the floor here? Yes. Um, Sorka McLone from Belwery High School. Um, this is for the proposition. So in America, Donald Trump nominated Mr. Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court, which severely divided the country and decreased the public's um, trust in the government. Can you really justify the, like, risking that type of situation here when the public already distrusts the government so much? Thank you. Yes, just there. Uh, I'm Hamish Temple from Peebles High School. Uh, if we were to have to build a second chamber, how much money would you be willing to uh, to invest in the project? And it's for the proposition. What price democracy? Any more questions here from the floor? Yes. My name's Jenna and I'm also from Inverkeeling High School. I've got a question for the prop proposition. Surely there must be a cost involved to make sure that people in the second chamber are representative of the people of Scotland. If so, how much of a cost do you think that will make up? Thank you very much. And I think so, yes. Young man here. Um, my name's David Fox from St Andrews and Brights High School. This is a question for the opposition. Um, you said that the second chamber was not forgotten about when the parliament was created, but do you not agree that the parliament was created for changing ideals? And what makes this any different of a changing ideals for the second chamber? Thank you. Yes. Farid Kinahan, Peebles High School for the proposition. You stated several times that this is about embracing the change uh, that would come with creating a second chamber. But in creating, effectively, a House of Lords, are we not reverting instead of changing? Very good. Any more questions from the floor here? Yes. 
Peebles High School. Um, I'm assuming we're going to take this money out of tax because I can't think of another logical way to get said money. And I wonder which sector you'd like to take that out of, education, health, service, etc. Thank you. I think there's another hand up over here. Oh, they are in the back, yes. Uh, Harry Mackle of St Andrews and Braid. Now, this question will go, go to either proposition or opposition. I, I'm just wondering, would you believe that the best way to settle this debate would to hand this question over to the Scottish people via a referendum of whether or not they would accept a second chamber to the Scottish Parliament? Another a referendum. That's a good one. First time we've mentioned tonight. Yes, young man there. Um, I'm Fraser Gilmore from People's High School, and this is for a proposition. Um, how do you know the people who would be elected in any form would be willing to represent um, where they come from or live? Thank you. A lot of very good questions and points here, which I mentally is Michael Dunn. Um, I know that point was actually addressed to the proposition, but just what you were talking about there with how it's representative of where people live and things like that, just to uh, remind everyone that the additional member system has two votes employed where you actually also get to vote for a regional MSP, which allows for a, a bit more kind of geographical uh, representation in Scotland as well. So for the sake of the uh, primary chamber, there is actually pretty fair representation geographically. Right in the middle there. Uh, Finn Thompson, Balfour High School. If you're proposing that the second chamber is elected by a local council, which are already elected, surely these local elections are going to become sort of elections for the second chamber, disregarding local issues that are important to communities. Yes. Hello, I'm Rory Clark from People's High School. Um, this is for the proposition once again. Um, are there any more studies or reports that suggest that we would gain from a second chamber? Thank you. Thank you, Rory. And yes. Uh, Harrison Carroll from St. Andrews and St. Bread. So this could go to either side, really, but I suppose it's more strongly towards the opposition. Is it not true that the House of Lords has done many great beneficial things for the country? It's been, you know, demonised quite a lot through the, the, the debate, quite frequently it has, but it's not, is it not true that it does serve its job incredibly well as a legislative body, despite any kind of so-called cronyism, it's still incredibly effective at its job? Thank you, guys. Matthew. Um, so, yes, we believe that the House of Lords is effective in England. However, as has been the bulk of our argument, the Scottish Parliament has functions, which mean that a House of Lords is not necessary in Scotland. We already have the functions which fulfil those roles effectively, and we don't need a second uh, chamber to fulfil them. Thank you. Our time's almost up. Any last contribution before we conclude the floor debate? Yes. Maddie Raver, Pupils High School again. I wonder why this is so prevalent right now when there are so many things going on in today's political climate. Could this not be postponed 20 years to where there's less prevalent matters going on or is this something that needs to be dealt with right now? Jessica McClure. Um, there's always going to be pre more prevalent matters going on and um, by having a second house, um, we would it would take like pressure off of... Um, Parliament, like so that legislation are being passed to the highest quality, um, to ensure that um, bills are being tackled to their fullest. Yeah. I think I saw one last hand. Yes. Nathan Koji, uh, Saint Andrew Sanson Bright. So you said that you want the representatives to represent the people, but you also said that you do not want them to be elected, but instead appointed. Isn't the whole point of elections to make sure that the representatives represent the people and not the government who actually appoints them? Thank you very much. And on that note, I think we are going to conclude the floor debate and we're going to move now to the uh, wind-up speeches. And I'm going to begin uh, by calling Matthew Burton to reply on behalf of the opposition. Matthew, you have three minutes. 
Uh, thank you once again, ladies and gentlemen. So, in my uh, reply speech, I'd like to cover some of the main clash points that there's been in this debate. And the four main clash points I've identified are the whole issue of cost and time and practicalities. Who sits in this chamber? It, can it be representative of the people of Scotland? Um, does the Scottish Parliament already provide appropriate scrutiny and would a second chamber actually provide any more? And can a second chamber that's appointed actually be democratic? So to start with the issue of cost and time. Said proposition said that this, the cost of elections is 0.2 million a year and by having it appointed we'd save compared to an elected second chamber. Yes, we might save 0.2 million a year compared to an elected second chamber. However, we're arguing for no second chamber at all. Just let me tell you that the Scottish, well, actually, as my partner mentioned earlier, the cost of building the Scottish Parliament is 400 million and the yearly running costs are 72 million. So, yes, we might save 0.2 million by having it appointed rather than elected, but we're still spending tens of millions a year on this second chamber. So, in fact, we are losing money by having a second chamber, not saving it. Uh, they also had a bit of a contradiction in their argument over time. They were saying that to save money, we could have the chamber sit part-time and sort of squeeze it in around our current chamber in the Scottish Parliament. However, they also argued that this chamber would have far more time than the current chamber to scrutinise legislation. How can it sit in here part-time, less frequently than the current chamber, and yet still have more time to scrutinise all the same pieces of legislation? It's, it's a bit of a contradiction, and in my mind, it doesn't really stand up. The second point of clash I'd like to discuss is who sits in this chamber and can it be representative? So again, the proposition gave us a bit of a contradiction because on one hand they said it should be selected by local councils and on the other hand they said it should be totally representative of the people of Scotland. If it's chosen by local councils, they will choose representatives who represent their own interests and their own political interests ago. of the party in charge. So that can't really also be representative and we find that a, a contradiction as well as the fact a representative chamber would be incredibly hard to implement and a council selected chamber is unnecessary since we already have appropriate regional rep representation by the fact our MSPs represent either constituencies or larger regions. One of the main points of clash has been scrutiny and do we have enough of it? They base the idea that we don't have enough scrutiny on our report about post-legislative scrutiny. In the Scottish Parliament, the scrutiny that goes on is pre-legislative scrutiny. Post-legislative scrutiny is what the Law Commission do and then refer to the Parliament. And so we feel they've sort of misunderstood that uh, point, that report, and that actually in the main type of scrutiny that the Scottish Parliament conducts, there is more than ample scrutiny provided by the committee system, as we have outlined repeatedly in our arguments. The final point of clash I'd like to discuss is can it be democratic? This one's pretty simple, ladies and gentlemen. If we appoint a chamber and it has power up, over an elected chamber, we are diluting the will of the people, and hence it is totally undemocratic to have an appointed second chamber. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. And now can I ask Sarah Mackay to reply for the proposition. Presiding officer, ladies and gentlemen, David Hume, an illustrious philosopher from this very city, once said, all free governments must consist of two councils, a lesser and a greater, or in other words, of a Senate and a people. The people would want wisdom without the Senate, the Senate without the people would want honesty. The proposition are here tonight to show you that in order to have a free government in Scotland, we must have a second chamber. This evening, I have identified three main points of clash, whether a second chamber would cost too much, whether the work of the current system makes a cha second chamber redundant, and whether an appointed chamber would be better than an elected one. Mr. Burton has said that there is no need to throw away vast amounts of money on a second chamber. But ladies and gentlemen, as the proposition have explained to you time and time again, the benefits that a second chamber can bring to Scotland hugely outweigh the cost. And, presiding officer, we've expressed that a second chamber need not cost an arm and a leg to bring, in order to bring the positives of improved legislation and further empowering councils to the body of Scotland. Fairer legislation, stronger councils, a more united Scotland. A further point of clash I have identified is that a committee-based legisl le legislature in Parliament makes the need for a second chamber redundant. Mr Burton has said that the current system scrutinises legislation enough and that the committee-based legislature in place was fine. However, ladies and gentlemen, 
It is quite clear the current system is not working as well as it needs to. Critics have said that it is not robust. Even high-ranking figures such as former presiding officers Tricia Marwick and Lord Steele have called for a second chamber in conjunction with the current system. We need to allow room for improvement, not be stuck in the past with just an all right system. The final point of clash identified was whether an appointed chamber would be more beneficial than an elected chamber. One minute to go. We've heard the opposition claim that it is the public's right to have a say on who would sit in this chamber, and it would be less democratic to have an appointed chamber. And ladies and gentlemen, the proposition does not dispute that the public would need to have a say in this chamber and would welcome nominations from the public on would-be members. But this does not cover the fact that elections are not perfect. Low voter turnout can result in a non-representative chamber. Only just over 50% of those eligible voted in the 2016 Scottish Parliament elections. We can have an equally representative, if not more, second chamber by appointing a widespread of our people here in Scotland. In conclusion, presiding officer, ladies and gentlemen, we are proposing a fairer Scotland, a freer Scotland, a flourishing Scotland. So why say no? Stand with us to not just make a stronger parliament, but a stronger Scotland. I beg you to propose this motion. Thank you very much. Can I thank uh, all our contributors this evening? Uh, that was an excellent debate. And uh, not only did you make excellent contributions, take interventions and respond to them. Um, you've done so within time which never happens in this parliament either. So uh, can I thank you very much for that? Uh, we're going to take a short comfort break now. Uh, when we return, if I could ask uh, both St. Margaret's and Bearsden just to go to the rows behind them to allow uh, Balfour and uh, St. Andrews to come to the front. Uh, so if we can come back. So we're ready to start promptly at 20 past seven, 7.20. Uh, but thank you very much indeed. Thank you to all of you. And a short break. <laughs>